First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 says, And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, the greatest of these is love. If you love the Lord, church, shout out, I love the Lord.
Good morning, First Baptist Church of Deanwood family and friends. I would like to welcome to any visitors visiting with us today. If there is any visitors, will you please stand? Yeah. 
and not being able to do the things that we would normally expect to do, it is a trial and can weigh down an adult. Yeah. Remember when you were a child, how that would have impacted you. And yet, by God's grace, he kept our children. Not only did he keep them, but he saved them yeah. in the midst of a pandemic. So, no, we've had children being baptized before and adults, but you know, as I was sharing with Minister Chance, the further away we get from a bad situation, the fuzzier our memories become. When we're in the midst of something, we're always crying out to God, and when he delivers us, we can forget over the course of time. But we never want our children to forget, these seven children, that they were the first that God brought through here at First Baptist Church of Deanwood to be baptized as soon as we were able to do so. And what's super duper wonderful is that two of them accepted Jesus before the pandemic hit. They wanted to be baptized, but then we had the pandemic. And you know what? As soon as we were able to baptize again, um, it was Leona and it was Brooklyn who said, can I now be baptized? They never baptized. So these children didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know when they accepted the Christ, they didn't know when they said, I want to be baptized, they didn't know. I want to set the record straight from the get-go. We don't give gifts to children because they are accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a gift in and to itself. We don't give gifts as some sort of bribe so they'll, they'll come forward and be baptized. But what we want to do is when they finish with their little gifts, we want them to hold on to it. So as they get older, day by day, year by year, decade by decade, as Jesus comes in the meantime, they're always going to remember that in the worst time of the world, God saw them through and they will continue to hold on to their faith. So as Deaconess Debbie will call the names of the children who are going to receive their token, let us remember that when we are faced with any kind of trial, with any kind of tribulation, God is right there and God never abandons us. Don't buy into the craziness of the world. He will see you through. He will hold on to you as he saw our children through. Thank you. stirring up that pool of Bethesda and anyone that walks into that pool will be healed in the name This morning we have, we present to Sister Brooklyn if you may come forward. Amen. Sister Nyla.
Leyana Demiri Smith. Thank you. 
for this opportunity, a golden opportunity, to give a portion back to you, to you bless it with it. You've been so good to us, oh Lord God. Throughout the year, all down throughout life, we have always, always remembered you, Lord God. Thank you again for these gifts, that they be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom on this side of the show. In the precious name that's above every single name, that name is Jesus. 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 In his name we pray. And God's people say, Amen. It's prayer time in the life of the church. It's prayer time in the life of the church. We're going to ask Brother George Thorne to come to us with our intercessory prayer. And as we say in times past, that prayer is an adventure. Prayer is the contact point to God. Did you hear me? I said prayer is the contact point to God. Let us enter into the throne room of God. Amen. Brother George. Father, I ask, Lord, that the 
here at First Baptist Church of Teamwork, Lord, I ask that you come back right now, Lord, Father, to give a special touch, a special power, Lord, Father, Lord, to give them strength and peace for those who may be wondering which way we want this or that, but yet, no, Lord, touch them, Lord, that there is hope and that you are still on the front line of all things that we must put our trust in you. Lord, touch us in a mighty way that as we reach out to our neighbors, merciful Father, Lord, that we be reminded of the great mission that we've been charged with. I thank you, merciful Father, especially for those, those who are on the front line, merciful Father, Lord, standing tall and boldly, merciful Father, in the battle, Lord. Oh, merciful Father, Lord, you have said to us to trust in the Lord and to lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways to acknowledge you, then you can break our path. First of all, you have said in John 3, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring fruit, and your fruit should remain. Oh, merciful Father, just Praise and praise and lift us up, merciful Father, Lord. Oh, uh, merciful Father, I even sometimes wonder, merciful Father, is this day will be the day that we truly embrace one another as truly as your children, Lord, as you will have us. But more so, Lord, I thank you for giving us the strength, the light, to have that gift that you have given to us as you did in the Pentecost. For those who have believed and received you, then we too can go forth to do wonders. First of all, we love you. We thank you. Oh, first of all, have your way, have your way in our lives. Lord, as you have the pastor that you are already known to have in place to come to first Baptist, Lord, strengthen us, Lord, as we come together in preparation even more so to receive that pastor. Merciful Father, that we be as one. Merciful Father, that we receive in unity. Be with the pulpit committee, merciful Father, Lord, in these decisions that they make, merciful Father, that you, Lord, guide them and strengthen them. All these things I ask and pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Are the people fantastic? I had an extra smile on my face when I looked over and saw that my daughter in love and her husband were in worship with us this morning and my little grandbaby who truly runs everybody. Well, for right now until he gets to be three. So, <laughs> but he's just so precious. There is a word from the Lord this morning. And as you know, we've been hanging out, looking at the 40 days since Jesus' resurrection, what happened between the resurrection and the ascension. And we were talking about how that in those 40 days, it's a period of time that we really don't talk about a lot, but it is so incredibly significant. So if you pray with me, and pray for me this morning, then I pray too that God will bless us as he blessed me when he dictated this message. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again. We come to you, Father, on this beautiful day. Yes, Lord, it is raining. Yes, Lord, for those of us who kind of go by the weather forecast, Went to sleep last night, didn't know you were going to be having some rain this morning, but we're grateful nonetheless because you've seen fit that if we had to make a wardrobe adjustment, you blessed us with the ability to do so. We're so grateful, Father, that you saw fit to wake us up this morning. Yes, Lord, we understand that there's nothing better than being with you, but we know that we want to be able to receive all of the rewards because we completed the work that you assigned our hands to do. So every day you wake us up is another opportunity to do things your way, to do things according to your will, and we are grateful. Now, Father, that it is preaching time, I ask that you hide me behind the cross, let it be your word that does come forth with power and authority. I ask, Father, that you open up the ears of your people, that they may clearly hear your word. Open up the minds of your people, that they can clearly understand your word. Open up the hearts of your people, that they will receive your word. And if there's anybody under the sound of my voice here this morning, or on Facebook, or later YouTube, or the teleconference line, Father, if they don't know you in the forgiveness of their sins, I ask right now in the majesty of the Lord Jesus that you especially knock on the door of their hearts, that they will come and give their lives to you. And Father, thank you for continuing to strengthen our faith muscles so that we can cheerfully obey and carry out your word. This prayer is offered in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus, who is the one and only Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're coming from the book of Acts. Specifically, it's chapter 1. I'll read for your hearing verses 1 through 3. And then we're going to tip on back over to Matthew, the 28th chapter. And it will be verses 17 through 20. And again, I'll be reading from the King James Version. And it reads, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Then going on over to Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 17 to 20. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the living. 
living God. As I said, the number 40, very significant, shows up over 146 times in the Holy Writ. When you see 40, spiritually, it signifies testing, trials, probation, or preparation for prosperity. It means a change is going to come. And we looked at three things, and this is the third thing we're looking at today, that Jesus did in the 40 days he walked the earth after the resurrection. We said in the first thing, he convinced, he had convinced his disciples that he was alive. Second thing he did was he comforted them. He had to say, okay, I'm here. And you know, last week we specifically zeroed in on Peter. Because we know that Peter had denied the Christ three times, and Peter needed to be restored. So he also convinced, and now, I'm sorry, he comforted. Now we're going to be looking at the third thing, which is he commissioned. Uh, my ears couldn't help but uh, perk up when I heard the prayer offered by missionary George, because I heard him say about the Great Commission. And I know that I have not spoken to him about where the Lord would have us this morning. So I can only give credit to the Holy Spirit that he's working in everything for us to understand what he wants us to know. When we look at the Great Commission, and I love how some people go, it's the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. And the thing about it, when we look at the Great Commission, we all talk about it, but do we do what Jesus said we're supposed to do. See, when you look at verse 17, where it says Jesus greeted them, there were some who worshipped, and yet some who doubted. And I was like, how can you doubt the risen Savior? You've now seen him, you've eaten with him, he's shown you that he rose again from the dead, and then I said, well, wait a minute, I can't be that hard on the disciples. How many of us come to church Sunday morning, we hear what the word has to say, but we still doubt it. Yeah. How do I know? Have you ever spoken to somebody? I mean, God has told you beyond a shadow of a doubt, go to this brother or this sister, tell them you know they're going through, but hold on a little bit longer, and God's got this, and they will thank you very much and say, I'm talking reality. You don't understand what I'm going through. That is when you are doubting what God is able to do. And the thing about it is when we allow that doubt to come in and take root, it becomes a dangerous thing. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem when I encounter doubt because I know full well that God saved me when I was five because he knew I was going to go around studying different religions and he had to make sure that when I challenged what his word said, that somehow, some way, I would come back to knowing, uh-uh, it is God and God alone. It is the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in the story. Don't add a thing to it, that's it. But, but see, too many of us get exposed to different things and because our faith has not been established, we start moving back and forth. You know, somebody will say one thing and be like, ooh, I like that, I'm going to hang out with here. Then somebody will say something else and we're like, ooh, I'm going to hang out and check this out. And you never get firmly rooted, so in times of trouble, in times of testing, you are jacked up because you didn't have that solid rock to hold on to. So now we find that some have doubted. I love Jesus. He knows how we are. He created us. He knows who we are. Even after he showed himself risen from the dead, even after we know that everything with him is yes and amen, we, he understands that somewhere in us is still this thing that says, I don't know that this really could happen. I don't know that I can really uh, believe that God is going to bring me through. But see, faith comes in. And faith says to you, God said it, that settles it. I love how man used to like to get in the middle of things. It was a bumper sticker once that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I'm like, oh, you need a big old magic marker. Cross through the I believe it, that settles it. God said it, and that settles it. Period in the story. So we look at what's going on with the Great Commission. You know, a commission is a command. It is 
not something that you can say, well, I'd rather not do this. When we accept Jesus the Christ as our Savior, when we say, yes, Lord, I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. I believe that you did suffer, bleed, and die. I believe that you died on the cross and that my sins were crucified with you. I believe that you rose again on the third day. When we believe that, then we have to work under the Great Commission. And too many folk think that it's somebody else's job with the Great Commission. They don't think that it means them, but it means every single last baptized believer. If you are saved and you were under the water and raised up out of that water, that means you've got a job to do. And if you're not living your life to reflect that God is a living God, if you're not living your life to reflect that you believe what the Holy Ghost church on Sunday morning. The only thing they have to do once they're saved is get baptized and they can just chill. Don't get me wrong. Yes, being saved trumps everything. Because when you're saved, you know that you know that you know that hell is no longer your destination. So that's a great thing. But Jesus did not say, I just want you to be saved and then sit on your rusty dusty. No, he said, I want you to be saved and I want you to go and
but disciples are not born instantaneously. When you become saved, that's step one, you're saved. When you're baptized, okay, you're baptized, but you're not a disciple until you really become a student, until you really become a scholar, until you really dedicate your life to learning about the one who saved you. What am I saying? Disciples are made every single day. None of us have a right to think just because we completed going through the Bible in one year that we got it down. Uh-uh, we just started. God is too big for us to think we could spend a thousand years studying the Word of God and we still would not understand every little bit of the Holy Word. All we have to do instead is like every day we are making disciples. Every day we're studying the Word. Every day we're growing closer to the Savior. Every day we're letting our talk match our walk. See, when we turn around and we see folk out in the world and they're like, well, you know, I go to church, but church is full of hypocrites. I mean, sometimes I go, you know, you are so right. Churches are full of hypocrites. Your workplace is full of hypocrites. The grocery store is full of hypocrites. The bank is full of hypocrites. And when you tell me the church is full of hypocrites, then you need to come on in. Because the fact of the matter is, when you walk into the church, what you're going to find are imperfect people who are being perfected by a perfect God. Too many times well, you know, church is a place that ought to be where you don't have any disagreements. Everything is beautiful. And you know, the birds are chirping. The sun is shining. Everybody loves on one another. You never hear a cross word. I don't know what church they go to, but the church that I know is made up of family. And if you ever see family, family will disagree from time to time. But if an outsider comes in and wants to mess with a family, you 
and they are terrified. So what you need to do is put aside your personal feelings and just lift up that person and hand them over to God. And that's something that you learn how to do. It's not easy because in your flesh, when somebody gets it wrong with you, you want to do this spinning thing. You want to turn around and say, well, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but let me get you straight. But instead of taking that attitude to the person, what you can do is say, God, you know what's going on with this person. I'm lifting them up to you. And if you find that it's like, I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but they made me so angry, then go ahead and say, Father, I'm talking to you now because I need you to work on I'm talking to you now because my flesh wants to rise up. I'm talking to you now because I'm determined to show the world that I am your disciple. I'm determined to show the world that I am your child. So work on me right now so I can pray for them. And I guarantee you, if you ask the Lord to remove whatever is the obstacle that's keeping you from praying for somebody, next thing you know, you will start saying, Lord, I'm lifting up so and so.
that there's work to do from the youngest to the oldest. We thank you for the reminder that everything that we do is going to be as unto you. And as we leave this place, we're grateful that we're never dismissed from your presence because of the awesome indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, be glory, honor, dominion,